We are live from New Delhi. You are watching DD India News, India's voice to the world. I am Lipakshi Khurana. Coming up in the next hour. Last day of campaigning for the first phase of India's general elections. 102 parliamentary constituencies will go to polls on April 19th. Third Israeli war cabinet session today to plan response to Iran's attack. Britain's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak speaks to Netanyahu, reiterates UK support for Israel's security. U.S. plans to impose new sanctions targeting Iran's missile drone program. EU working on expanding Iran sanctions. And in Champions League thriller, Paris Saint-Germain stunned Barcelona while Borussia Dortmund down Atletico Madrid to set up semi-final clash against each other. Also, Ram Navmi, the birthday celebration of Lord Ram being celebrated across India. Special arrangements in place at Ram Temple in Ayodhya to mark the occasion. Let's now get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Well, today is the last day of campaigning for the first phase of India's general elections. Strict regulations will come into force from 6 p.m. IST on Wednesday. The regulations will be in force till the closure of polls. Voting for the first phase of India's general elections will take place on April 19th. People in 102 constituencies across 21 states and union territories will cast their votes in phase one. The general elections will be held in seven phases, concluded on June 1st. The counting of votes will take place on the 4th of June. Well, election season is at its peak in India with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for the 19th of this month. In order to garner support for the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is to hold rallies in northern and eastern states of Assam and Tripura. Senior BJP leader and Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will address three rallies in Kerala's Kannur, Kasargore and Vadakara towns. All 20 Lok Sabha seats of the state go to polls in the first phase. Senior BJP leader and Union Minister Nitin Gadkari will virtually address people in Maharashtra's Nagpur, where he is up against Congress's Indie Bloc candidate Vikas Thakre. Senior BJP leader and Union Minister Dr. Jitendra Singh to lead a road show in Jammu's Katwa. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi is to hold rallies in Karnataka's Mandya and Kola today. The grand old party is facing JDS, which is BJP's ally in both seats. Congress General Secretary Priyanka Gandhi Vadra will lead a roadshow at Saharanpur in Indian state of Uttar Pradesh in support of the Indi Alliance candidate Imran Masood. Bhaujan Samaj Party leader Mayavati will also campaign in Rajasthan's Alwar. West Bengal Chief Minister and All India Trinamool Congress Chairperson Mamta Banerjee to address public rally in Silchar in North Indian state of Assam. Well, Chhattisgarh in central India was formed out of Madhya Pradesh to become the Indian Union's 26th state. It is also known as the Rice Bowl of India. The Hindi heartland is India's 10th largest state and a major producer of energy and steel. Let us understand why Chhattisgarh matters as India decides in 2024. Yeah. 
Chhattisgarh, the landlocked state in central India, is known for its lush green stretches of forest covers, breathtaking natural beauty, diverse tribal heritage, and rich mineral deposits. Home to people from 42 different tribes, the cultural life of Chhattisgarh comprises varied forms of traditional art and crafts. Tribal dances, folk songs, regional festivals and fairs and amusing cultural fests. In fact, Chhattisgarh's Dhokra art, inspired by tribal themes of animals, mythical creatures, human creatures, natural shapes etc., is now quite popular beyond the borders of India. Spreads over 135,000 square kilometers, the state is also known as the bowl of rice as the region grows over 20,000 varieties of rice. Chhattisgarh shares its borders with seven Indian states. Originally a part of Madhya Pradesh, it was carved out and granted statehood on November 1st, 2000 with Raipur as its designated state capital. With 11 seats in the Lok Sabha or the lower house of the Indian Parliament, Chhattisgarh is going to the general elections in three phases between April 19th to May 7th. The state's 20.5 million registered voters are ready to exercise their electoral duty. Out of the total number of voters, 10.1 million are male, while about 10.3 million are female. About 732 voters are from the third gender category. The state is currently governed by the Bharatiya Janata Party, which backed a majority support in the state elections held in December 2023. The major parties in the state are the Bharatiya Janata Party and the Indian National Congress. The other political parties which have been contesting in the state as well as national elections here are the Janata Congress Chhattisgarh, Gondwana Ganatantra Party and the Bahujan Samaj Party. In the 2019 general elections, the Bharatiya Janata Party won nine seats with a vote share of 51.40% and the Indian National Congress bagged two seats. In the backdrop of a dramatic comeback in recently held state elections by the BJP, all eyes are keenly looking forward to the general election contest when arch-rival Congress and BJP once again lock horns in a two-party fight. Antra Sinha for DD India. Well, Dibrugarh constituency in Upper Assam is going to polls in the first of the seven-phase general elections in India. Here, the tea garden workers play a crucial role in sealing the fate of the political leaders. Take a look at the special report by Didi India's Debiendu Mondal on the life of the tea garden workers and the political battle this constituency. We are at the Dibrugar constituency in Assam and this place is known as the tea capital of India. And behind me you can see the sprawling tea garden which is part of this particular constituency which goes to polls on the 19th of April. And these tea workers constitute about 30% of the vote bank here in uh, the Dibrugar constituency. These sprawling tea gardens spread across thousands of acres around the Dibrugar constituency have many tea estates which employ millions of such tea garden workers. These tea garden workers become a deciding factor for the fate of the political leaders testing their water in the elections here. But the life and livelihood of these tea garden workers, they say, have not improved over the last many decades. What they earn after a day's labor is a meager rupees 250. These workers for long have been demanding to increase their wages to at least rupees 350. What they say, even though the government here has given an in-principle approval for the demand, it has not yet been implemented. The wage of rupees 250 is what we get is very less. It should be increased to at least 300 now. Even though the tea workers are given residential colonies by the tea estate owners, what they don't have a home which they can call their own. The houses, many of which are not pakka and some even live in poor conditions. The government has although provided toilets for sanitation, clean drinking water still remains a problem. But what changed in the last few years are the construction of these metal roads. 
What can we say? We are poor people. We have to work here only. We have schools, but we not have much access to facilities from the government here. The money we get is not even enough to meet our daily needs. The T estates have their own primary schools and elementary hospitals provided by the T estate owners but supported by the government. The tea factories are also within the tea estate and such factories produce some of the finest tea in the world, exported to many different countries. But who would be able to win the hearts of these tea garden workers? Some say they would support who supports them. Those who support us, we will support them. The prices of essential materials have increased so much. What we will do in Rs 150? Our homes are broken. We can't even repair it. We are not even getting clean drinking waters regularly. But I think the BJP is good. They will do good for us. Dibrugarh is witnessing a fierce contest between the Assam Jatiya Parishad, part of the India Alliance and the BJP. From bike rallies being organized to public meetings with traditional themes, both the parties are giving the last push to win the hearts of the voters. This tea factory behind me which employs thousands of people and the road which has been developed by the government and which leads to the residential colonies of these tea workers that are in thousands here in Dibrugarh will decide who their elected MP would be on the 19th of April that will go to the parliament of India. With camera person Jagmohan, this is the BNDU model from Dibrugarh, Assam for DD India. And the Dibrukar constituency in Assam is witnessing a fierce political fight between the Indi Alliance and the BJP. With polls in this part of Assam just days ahead, campaigning by the candidates are in full swing. The AGP organized a bike rally in Tenga Khat of the Dibrukar constituency and amidst the campaign, Didi India correspondent caught up with Larun Jyoti Gugoi, Assam Jatiya Parishad candidate, to find out what he promises to the people here. Listen in. I am joined by the AJP candidate Larunjati Gogoi from the Dibrugarh constituency who is contesting against the sitting union minister of the BJP, Sarbananda Sonowal. He is holding a rally as you can see behind me. Uh, Larunjati, what is the confidence that drives you to a seat, to a VIP seat like Dibrugarh? I am very much confident because uh, uh, Sonowal is a symbol of failure. If you see the whole career as a chief minister, as a national minister, central minister, uh, the, or genuine issue of the state, he has totally failed to fulfill the aspiration of the people. I'm proposing them that we will raise this issue in the national forum, that in, in, the, in the national level, in all states, there should be a equal, equal wages for all, all, all tea garden laborers and other issues like the giving patta in tea garden lenders and other, other genuine issues like health. No, no doctor in the hospital and uh, no regular teacher in the school uh, which are running in the tea garden area. These are basic issue, fundamental issue. So the, uh, the tea garden, uh, the voters, they are very much interested. They are against the BJP agenda and we are, uh, we are proposing uh, to settle down all this issue in the, and we, we will raise their issue in the national forum. So is CA also an issue in this, this particular region? Definitely, definitely. CA is a very uh, genuine issue. Uh, CA is very dangerous to the common people and uh, the people of Assam, they are very much aware that uh, uh, we are under threat uh, by our, uh, our culture, our civilization, our language, our every, uh, in every aspect uh, we are under threat. Therefore, uh, we, uh, we have already accepted the load of uh, illegal foreigner up to 71. There, so there is no question of taking the load of illegal foreigner in the name of religion after 71. Well, thank you so much, Tarunjit, uh, for speaking to uh, Doordarshan. Uh, this is the BNDU model from the election rally of Larunjati Gogoi from Dibrugarh in Assam with Jagmohan Pradhan for DD India. Well, campaign for the lower house of Indian parliament is in full swing, but the wedding season amidst polls in the state of Rajasthan has made the festival of democracy more colourful. DD India correspondent Vishal Baristo brings you this report. Exchanging the rings, this couple is preparing for a traditional Marwadi wedding. Based in Dubai, 
The groom is a chartered accountant and would be casting his vote for the very first time on 19th April. Meri shaadi 18th April ko hai and I am very excited for my new life and for the elections. Jaipur ke andar election bhi 19th April ko hai. According to the Hindu religion, the auspicious dates for getting married start from 17th of this month. Daave ka matlab hota hai shaadi ko The wedding date start from 17th. According to Hindu belief, this is the most auspicious time to get married. कार्यक्रम होता है। क्लैश ऑफ डेट्स बिटवीन इलेक्शंस एंड वेडिंग्स इज सडनली एन इम्पोर्टेंट इशू फॉर द ब्राइड इलेक्शंस भी है उसमें I am missing some of the guests who couldn't make it because of the elections। मतलब इसके बाद में मिल लेंगे और जो भी यहाँ पे नहीं है मारवाड़ी वेडिंग्स ऑफ राजस्थान इज क्वाइट पॉपुलर विद इंडियन मूवीज इट इज द रिचुअल दैट प्रिसीड द वेडिंग दैट मेक इट क्वाइट ट्रेडिशनल एंड कलरफुल ये हमारे राजस्थान में In the tikka ceremony we exchange gifts. The ring ceremony bhi bolte hain. The pleasant coincidence of weddings between elections had made the celebration of democracy more colorful. Vishal Barrister's report for DD India. And still to come on DD India news hour. UK House of Commons bans tobacco sales for anyone born in 2009 or later. After Baltimore experts warn other nearby bridges could also crumble in the event of a maritime collision of the same magnitude. UAE reels under hazardous weather red alert issued across the country to buy airports temporarily diverts all inbound flights. Indian state of Tamil Nadu voting is our responsibility this is a big fight between uh, BJP and uh, India alliance will you vote ha ah, vote we yeah, are power of democracy this is a huge BJP is trying her best you know for the past 10 years under the flagship of uh, Sri Narendra Modi Gado. The 2024 Lok Sabha polls in Tamil Nadu are witnessing the battle royale between DMK AI DMK and the BJP Welcome back you watch in the India news I'm Lepak Shikran and moving on another meeting of Israel's war cabinet will be held today to decide on a response to Iran's first ever direct attack it will be the third time that the decision making cabinet convenes since Iran launched more than 300 missiles and drones against Israel on Saturday night earlier military chief of staff Harzi Halevi had promised that Saturday night's attack from Iran at Israeli territory will be met with a response And British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has called for calm heads during a phone call with Israeli counterpart Netanyahu. Sunak told Netanyahu on Tuesday that escalation in the Middle East was in no one's interest and would only deepen insecurity in the Middle East. Sunak added that the UK wants to see a massive step change in the amount of aid being delivered to Gaza. While the US is planning to impose new sanctions targeting Iran's missile and drone program in the coming days, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has said that the US will impose new sanctions on Iran's missile and drone programs and new sanctions against entities backing the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and Iran's defense ministry in the coming days. In a statement Sullivan said following Iran's unprecedented attack against Israel President Biden is coordinating with allies and partners including the G7 and with bipartisan leaders in Congress on a comprehensive response Sullivan added that the US also expects its allies and partners to impose sanctions against Iran He said that the US continues to work to further strengthen and expand the successful integration of air and missile defense and early warning systems across the Middle East to further road the effectiveness of Iran's missile and UAV capabilities 
An EU foreign policy chief, uh, Joseph Borrell, said Brussels is starting work on expanding sanctions against Iran after Tehran's attack on Israel. Speaking after an emergency online meeting of EU foreign ministers, Borrell said the bloc would look to toughen measures against Iran's supplies of weaponry, including drones to Russia and proxy groups around the Middle East. First, as expected, everybody a strong condemnation of the Iranian attack, a strong unity about it. Also, the member states reaffirm their commitment, the commitment of the European Union to Israel's security. And third, we remain united in the objective of uh, avoid further escalation and call all actors to show restraint. After this meeting, uh, we will increase our outreach with the key partners in the region and some member states propose the adoption of uh, uh, expand the restrictive measures against Iran, adopting an expansion of restrictive measures against Iran. I will send to the external action service the request to start the necessary work related to these sanctions. Meanwhile, U.S. Republican-led House of Representatives would vote this week on advancing a long-stalled national security spending package to aid Israel, Ukraine and other American allies. It comes days after Iran launched a large aerial attack on Israel, amplifying calls for Congress to move quickly to approve the pending aid bill. Speaker Mike Johnson said he would cobble together a legislative package that roughly mirrors the $95 billion aid bill the Senate passed two months ago, but that is broken down into three pieces. Lawmakers would vote separately on a bill providing money for Israel, one allocating funding for Ukraine, and a third with aid for Taiwan and other allies. They would cast a fourth vote on a separate measure containing other policies popular among Republicans. And the UK House of Commoners provided a bill on Tuesday that will ban tobacco sales for anyone born in 2009 or later. The policy pushed by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak passed its first parliamentary vote, although dozens of his own lawmakers voted against it. The bill passed a vote in Britain's parliament with 383 in favour and 67 against, meaning it will progress to the next stage in parliament where it can be subjected to amendment. The legislation is one of Sunak's flagship policies before an election later this year. The Tobacco and Vapes Bill aims to prevent children born since 2009 from ever being able to legally buy tobacco rather than criminalizing the habit. And after two days of jury selection, the first seven jurors were selected on Tuesday to serve on Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. The judge also warned lawyers that he would not tolerate any efforts to intimidate prospective jurors after saying Trump was audibly muttering while one of the possible members of the panel was questioned. Trump faces 34 felony counts of falsifying business records to cover up a hush money payment to an adult short star shortly before the 2016 election. Trump has pleaded not guilty and denies an encounter took place. Trump spoke out against the judge overseeing his New York criminal trial, repeatedly calling him conflicted and saying he should not be there. I heard 78% think it's a rigged deal. And it is a rigged deal. It's a rigged trial. Our courts, everything is screwed up in New York. And the whole world is watching. This judge is so conflicted. You understand that. You'll take a look at that. There's never been a judge so conflicted as this. It's ridiculous. And also, there's no crime. Well, the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in the U.S. port of Baltimore last month was of near unprecedented scale, according to the state's governor. Six people died when a cargo ship lost power and slammed into the major river crossing, knocking it over. Weeks on, the vessel's 21-man crew, all but one of whom are Indian citizens, remain on board. But the almost unthinkable tragedy is at risk of being repeated elsewhere in the United States. Experts warn other nearby bridges could also crumble in the event of a maritime collision of the same magnitude, as Benji Hayo reports for more. This 
is the key bridge. The fatal crash caught on camera a deadly accident, an economic catastrophe. And this is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, just 30 kilometers downstream, a vital gateway outside of Washington, D.C., a local and national landmark. It shares the same shipping lane as the Key Bridge, except it's older, bigger, busier. Seven kilometers in length, carrying 27 million vehicles a year, 11 million tons of cargo passes under it annually, and it's ranked as one of the scariest bridges in America. Why? Well, there's very little in the way of protection around the key pylons holding up this vast structure. It's hard to see from here, but all that borders the corroding metal piers supporting the road above are narrow wooden buffers. Experts we've spoken to say that without reinforcement efforts, a container shipper, a large heavy one, hitting that bridge would take it down in one fell swoop. It's a disaster waiting to happen. It will collapse in the same manner because that bridge also is, is fracture critical, just like the key bridge was. And fracture critical means that if one piece of the bridge support system or the bridge system itself fails uh, or fractures, the whole bridge or a large section of the bridge could go down, just like the key bridge. Being fracture critical is not the sole reason for the key bridge's dramatic collapse. Investigations are underway to determine the main cause. Though it is a risk for bridges like the one in Chesapeake Bay. The Maryland Transportation Authority says it's considering adding increased protections to slow or deflect a ship, lessening the blow. One possible solution, what's known as dolphins. They look like columns, they're a little bit large and they're essentially anchored down in the seabed. Um, uh, but also we have the fender systems, and these fender systems serve different purpose. They're usually uh, located uh, um, a little bit closer to the bridge, and the whole idea is that they will kind of, if a ship is coming close, they will guide it around the pier and make sure it doesn't hit it, but it kind of goes around it. Uh, um, there's that third system that you probably saw uh, is what they call burial uh, islands. So there are these islands where the pier is sitting on an island or the, col the bridge column is sitting on an island that is made out of rocks. And when the ship comes close to the column or the pier, it would you know, glide on this island and ultimately these rocks would stop them. Reducing an impact even by a few seconds can make a massive difference. But any construction here is yet to begin. These measures are expensive and they don't always work. The key bridge, for example, had dolphins. It wasn't enough to prevent this from happening. Benji Hire in Maryland reporting for DD India. Well, unstable weather and heavy rain continue to overtake parts of the United Arab Emirates, flooding some streets and stalling traffic in Dubai. Red alert issued across the country. Dubai International Airport temporarily diverted arriving flights on Tuesday evening until weather conditions improve. Fly Dubai has meanwhile suspended all flights departing from Dubai due to the bad weather. And still to come on DD India News Hour. We bring you ground reports from various states as our reporters bring us the political scene heating up there with just one day to go for the first phase of elections to begin. India's very own Charlie Chaplin raises water awareness in Jammun Kashmir. And 29 Naxalites killed in an encounter in Kanke district in the central Indian state of Chhattisgarh on Tuesday. Tracking the first phase of gender elections, Team Pole Pulse has reached India's northeast in Assam. This is the tea city of India, Dibrugarh. They are not getting jobs in the local area, like in Dibrugarh or nearby districts and all. Home to the finest tea, the state is set for a cracker of a contest. 
This is 2024. Can the Congress and allies offer a fight back or will the Modi juggernaut be unstoppable? Watch Pull Pulse on DT India. Welcome back. You're watching DT India News. I'm Lipak Shikunar and time now for a quick recap of the headlines. Last day of campaigning for the first phase of India's general elections, 102 parliamentary constituencies will go to polls on April 19th. Third Israeli war cabinet session today to plan response to Iran's attack. Britain's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak speaks to Netanyahu, reiterates UK support for Israel's security. U.S. plans to impose new sanctions targeting Iran's missile, drone program, EU working on expanding Iran's sanctions. In Champions League thriller, Paris Saint-Germain stunned Barcelona while Brasseria Dortmund down Atletico Madrid to set up semi-final clash against each other. And Ram Navmi, the birthday celebration of Lord Ram being celebrated across India, special arrangements in place at Ram Temple in Ayodhya to mark the occasion. And India gears up for the Festival of Democracy beginning on April 19th with the first phase of polling. People in 102 constituencies across 21 states and union territories will cast their votes on the 19th of April 2024. Among the major states going to polls in phase one are Assam, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu and Uttarakhand. While 10 states and UTs will be fully covered, 11 states and UTs will be partially covered in phase 1. Besides the lower house polls, Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh will also vote to elect their respective assemblies. All right, we are now joined by our correspondents for more on elections. We have Shishir Sheller from Maharashtra and we have uh, Prasenjit from Kolkata with us. Right, uh, good morning Shishir. My first question to you. Uh, in these elections, uh, Maharashtra of course holds importance for all the political parties. Uh, as we know, it is the second highest number of seats after Uttar Pradesh. Now, amid the changing poll uh, equations in the state, could you brace up with the current scenario there? Well, absolutely. Uh, no, uh, Maharashtra is going for the poll on the 19th of April, the first phase election, and nearly five seats from Maharashtra, and especially from Eastern Vidarbha, is going for the poll. Now, Eastern Vidarbha is quite important, crucial, uh, you know, uh, region from Maharashtra's perspective as well, uh, because the big leaders coming in uh, from this particular region, be it Nitin Gadkari from Nagpur, Devendra Parmes, uh, who is also a deputy chief minister of Maharashtra, comes from uh, Maharashtra, then Sudhir Mungantiwar, BJP, who also comes from. Uh, the same region, the Eastern Vidarbha region. So obviously the big names are in place uh, for this particular uh, phase of election and that's reason we have seen all the star campaigners campaigning around the clock in Nagpur and around the city. The, another important aspect why it is uh, important because uh, we've also seen that the Gatshirul district will also go for the poll. Now this is one of the sensitive areas. Uh, we have seen the Nagsal movement uh, uh, in this particular region since last many years. But obviously the continuous efforts by this government, uh, now we have seen a drop in those movements and most of the people uh, have now uh, shifted uh, towards a normal life. Most of them have surrendered, and that's the reason this region is also particularly important uh, when it's going to the, uh, no, uh, for the poll on the first uh, phase here. The third important destination, the third important constituency is Chandrapur. Now, Chandrapur is known for the black gold uh, because most of the mining activity of Maharashtra uh, happens in Chandrapur, and that's the reason you have seen some of the big factories are uh, situated in Chandrapur region, uh, steel factories also, and even uh, the coal factories also, and that's the reason. Industry-wise, if you look at uh, Chandrapur, is very important uh, constituency. So, in, uh, Chandrapur is also uh, going for the for the poll here. Uh, and the fourth one, that the Ramtek constituency. Now, the Ramtek constituency is actually a reserve constituency for SCNS uh, category. That also will go for the poll. So, obviously, uh, in this particular election, we just don't have to see uh, the development, but also the caste factor and the social issues will also play an important role. And when all these uh, big star campaigners campaigning uh, in these five constituencies in Maharashtra, they are keeping in mind that 
they have to make uh, they have to strike a balance between all the development projects they have done at the same time what they are going to issue uh, to the people, especially the social media told and how they can manage uh, you know, uh, the class mathematics. So these are the uh, all equal points uh, that probably uh, they all are looking forward. Now, as far as Congress perspective is concerned, let me tell you that Eastern Middle of the region, once known as the Congress, uh, that's near. Uh, but over a period of time, we have seen that the Congress has lost that grip uh, on this region. And that's the reason now we have seen the BJP and the Shinstena uh, is quite stronger at this point in time uh, in this particular region. Well, uh, now this is probably time that Congress won uh, you know, again to get back their own old back. And that's the reason they have fielded various candidates. For example, uh, in Chandrapur, uh, we, have, we have seen a women candidate, Pratibha Dhanurka, contesting from, uh, from Congress side. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, talking about Pratibha, she don't have any experience in politics so far, but in spite of that, uh, you know, she is into pray and probably, as I told you, that the caste factor may I uh, know uh, uh, gives some advantage uh, to Pratibha uh, Bhanurkar. On the other hand, if you look, uh, look at the Nagpur constituencies where Nitin Gadkari, uh, the union minister, is contesting against him, Congress has fielded uh, a local leader, probably uh, Mr. Thakre. Obviously, Thakre has a very good support on the ground in Nagpur, but how he is going to get that uh, support? You know, convert, convert that support into the seat uh, is the major factor. So these all equations will definitely. Uh, all these political parties and leaders must have kept in mind and the people actually play quite important role here because ultimately it's their issues uh, that these you know, leaders will uh, represent in the parliament. That's the reason um, you know, uh, the employment uh, generation is a major important issue, issue for, especially for the youngsters. The other important is inflation and third very important issue that how these right. cities or this region has changed over a period of time. People will also keep that in mind when they go for poll. Right. All right. Okay. So, uh, my next question to you, Prasenjit. Uh, if you talk about West Bengal, what dominates the first phase of elections there and how close is the race between uh, the major parties? Uh, look, Nipaksi, it is uh, tea, timber and tourism. This, these are the three major issues uh, which uh, uh, are dominated in these three constituencies. You know that this Alipur Dwar. Kuch Bihar and Jalpaiguri, this is the Duas region, farthest north of uh, West Bengal, and this is called Duas region. This region is famous for tea, famous for timber, and famous for tourism. So, uh, uh, these are the three issues which will be not dominating, and uh, uh, particularly in these three constituencies in 2019, uh, dominancy was of BJP. And uh, uh, Trinamool Congress of the other, they are desperately trying to get back uh, uh, their foothold in these three constituencies. And that is why uh, the Chief Minister of West Bengal and the Chairperson of Trinamool Congress, Mamta Banerjee, uh, was camping in this area for the last 10-15 uh, days. And along with the General Secretary of the party, uh, Arishad Banerjee also. So, uh, uh, and on the other hand, Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself uh, visited this place frequently in uh, uh, his uh, election campaign. So, you may, uh, I mean to say that uh, these three constituencies is very crucial, uh, at least for get the mental um, uh, strength for both the parties. If uh, the BJP uh, is satisfied with the uh, uh, 19th uh, April polling, then that will be uh, an age for them. Uh, and uh, at the same time, if uh, Trinamool Congress can get back their foothold uh, during the day of polling, then that will be an aim. So, a uh, very intense fight we are going to um, uh, see on 19th of April in this area. Uh, if I say that uh, the star um, uh, candidate for this area is of course the Minister of State for Home Affairs, Mr. Nishit Pramanik is again contesting for his Koch uh, Bihar constituency and uh, Dr. John Torai from uh, uh, Jalpaiguri constituency on behalf of BJP. In uh, Alipur Dwar, BJP has changed the uh, former minister or the press, uh, incumbent minister, John Barla, is replaced by Manoj Tigda. But Manoj Tigda is also uh, a very uh, big name for uh, West Bengal BJP politics because he is chief whip in uh, assembly of the, of the BJP uh, uh, assembly team. Uh, so in that case, uh, uh, the BJP is with high profile candidates in this area. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Trinamool is also uh, filed uh, uh, on one place as right. uh, existing Rajya Sabha, existing Rajya Sabha candidate, or existing Vidhan Sabha uh, uh, MLA, right. 
So in every way, uh, this is a very intense fight between BJP and Trinamool Congress. Yes, Kibasi. yes, it is. Thank you so much, Prasenjit and Shishir, for joining us and giving us that information. And moving on, India's very own Charlie Chaplin has launched a nationwide water awareness campaign program ahead of the country's lower house elections. Rajan Kumar, an actor known for mimicking the great Charlie Chaplin, launched the initiative in northern India's German Kashmir on Tuesday. Kumar plans to take it to the far corners of the country before culminating in southern India's Kanyakumari. Kumar was seen going around Srinagar, raising awareness among locals of the need to exercise their democratic right to vote while being dressed in the trademark attire of the legendary actor and comic icon. And in one of the largest operations by security forces in Chhattisgarh, 29 Naxalites were killed in an encounter in Kanke district in the central Indian state of Chhattisgarh on Tuesday. This figure can go up as the search operation is still on, Chhattisgarh police said. According to officials, if the figure crosses 30 casualties from the Naxal side, this would be the largest operation by forces in the past 10 years. Bodies of the all the 29 Naxalites were recovered, while of them, three have been identified so far. AK-47 rifles and large cache of grenades were recovered. Three security personnel who were injured in the operation are out of danger. And Didi India, Somesh Patel joins us from Chhattisgarh. Uh, well, Somesh, uh, can you give us an update on the entire operation? Yeah, at last 29 Naxal, including uh, their uh, top leaders, were killed on the Thursday in a joint operation by teams in the border secretary fourth. BSF and the dust uh, BSF in the district reserve guard DRG in Chhattisgarh Kanke district. The Naxal uh, leader Sankar uh, Rao, uh, Rao had a reward in the 25 lakh. His head in the police said three soldiers were injured in the encounter and 80 bodies have been recovered. Said official are last cause in the weapons including 7 AK-47 and 3 light machine gun were also recovered in the site. All right. Thank you so much, Sumesh, for that update from there. And moving on, the newly built Ram Temple in Uttar Pradesh's Ayodhya is all decked up for Ram Navmi celebrations. The festivities, which fall on the ninth day of the Chaitra month, mark Ram Lalla's birth. Devotees thronged in large numbers to get a glimpse of the deity. This year, the auspicious occasion will be more special by Surya Abhishek of Ramlala when the sun's rays will fall on the forehead of the deity's idol at noon. The celebrations mark the first big religious occasion after the consecration of Ramlala in January this year. And on the auspicious occasion of Ram Navmi, Sudarshan Patnayak, the renowned sand artist hailing from Odisha, unveiled a breathtaking sand sculpture depicting Lord Ram. This is the first time that the country is celebrating Lord Ram's birthday with the magnificent Ram Temple established in Uttar Pradesh's Ayodhya. The Ram Temple stands as a symbol of reverence and devotion, marking the purported birthplace of Lord Ram, known as Ram Lalla. And still to come on DD India News. Now. International Monetary Fund has increased India's growth forecast for 2024 in its World Economic Outlook report. In IPL, Delhi Capitals will face off Gujarat Titans a day after Rajasthan Royals beat Kolkata Knight Riders by two wickets. 
and excitement grows as today marks 100 days until the 2024 Olympics get underway. But the build-up has not been without controversy. We'll tell you more ahead. As a cycle of accountability returns, the time has come when the biggest democracy chooses to write another chapter in its glorious history. Development, justice, regionalism, a big political canvas. Everything will be put to test in this mega battle for glory. DD India dissects what makes elections 2024 the battle royale in Indian politics. Data and analysis free from bias to help you understand why India matters. The Great Indian Election on weekdays at 8.30 p.m. only on TV India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lipak Shikunan and on to some business news now. The International Monetary Fund has increased India's growth forecast for 2024 in its World Economic Outlook report. The latest forecast comes from the IMF spring meetings, which are an opportunity to assess how economies are faring amid a variety of global pressures. Nick Harper reports for more from Washington. Well, the International Monetary Fund says it's been surprised by a high level of resiliency. It's better than expected data shows that many global markets are rebounding in a post-pandemic world. India comes out as one of the star performers, remaining as it does as one of the countries with the best forecasts. The IMF has increased its prediction for 2024 growth, boosting it by 0.3%, now forecasting that India will see 6.8% growth this year. The IMF says growth is projected to remain strong in the country in 2024, with the robustness reflecting continuing strength in domestic demand and rising work age population. From a global perspective, the World Economic Outlook forecasts 3.2% global growth this year. One area of particular weakness is China's property sector. The IMF warns that without a government-led restructuring package, the sector will drag down growth in China even further over the next year or so. Growth for this year is forecast for 4.6%. The spring meetings taking place here in Washington, D.C. this week have also highlighted a strengthening U.S. economy. The IMF saying that increased employment and significant consumer spending could help to boost global growth over the coming year. But there is a warning for the US Federal Reserve and other central banks. Following a period of increased interest rates, the IMF now says it will be up to central bankers to reduce rates gradually to prevent tipping economies into recession and achieving instead that hoped for soft landing. Nick Harper in Washington reporting for DD India. While well, U.S. stocks ended lower in choppy trading on Tuesday as Treasury yields climbed, with investors weighing the likely path of interest rates in a resilient U.S. economy with persistent inflation. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said on Tuesday, recent inflation data has not given policymakers enough confidence to ease credit soon, noting that the U.S. Central Bank may need to keep rates higher for longer than previously thought. The S&P 500 lost 0.21 percent, while the Nasdaq Composite fell 0.12 percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.17 percent. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq are nearly 4 percent off from record high levels reached last month. And Asian shares were mixed on Wednesday as Fed's Powell rethinks rate cuts, pushing Treasury yields to new five months high. The beleaguered yen is plumbing fresh 34-year lows on an almost daily basis. It was last steady at 154.62 per dollar. MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan rose 0.2 percent after plunging more than 4 percent in the past three sessions. Taiwanese share outperformed with a gain of 1 percent, while other markets were lackluster. Japan's Nikkei dropped 0.7 percent to the lowest in two months. China's blue chips fell 0.1 percent, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index edged 0.1 percent. Higher. Well, you're watching Did India News. Our time now for some sports news. 
Gujarat Titans are set to host Delhi Capitals today at Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad on Wednesday. The host currently stand at number six at the points table, whereas the Rishabh Pant led Delhi Capitals are at the ninth position. Both teams have played six matches each, and out of them, GT have won three and DC have won only two matches. In April 17th marks 100 days until the 2024 Olympics get underway. Excitement is growing, but so too is discontent among some Parisians. The athletes' village is ready and venues are having the final touches applied. However, the build-up has not been without controversy, as DT India correspondent Ross Cullen reports for more. This year's Olympic and Paralympic Games are now just 100 days away and the final preparations are in full swing. It's the third time the French capital is hosting the Games and it comes 100 years after it was last in Paris in 1924. But the build-up has not been plain sailing. Tourist boats and cargo ships will be forced to alter their schedules due to the planned opening ceremony and some swimming events in and on the River Seine. This has never been done. It's never been tried before. So we're leaping into the unknown. We have to limit all the risks and there is a significant security element. And effectively, that will impact our activities. That's undeniable. For some Paris businesses, the games could provide an economic boost. Some restaurants near the famous Champs-Élysées Boulevard are hiring more staff and extending their hours for the summer. For uh, restaurants, we will uh, be able to uh, to show our uh, to show our uh, culture, French culture, and to uh, give a good experience and the best experience uh, possible to our clients coming from all over all over the world. However, there has been criticism that event prices were beyond most budgets. In response. One million free tickets were handed out to young people, amateur athletes and people with disabilities. And Parisians are nervous about the security impacts on daily life. QR codes will be needed to access certain areas near Olympic venues and there will be mass surveillance by the French authorities. The arenas are being readied and the final preparations are underway for Paris to host the biggest multidiscipline sporting gathering in the world. But as with any athletics event, there are always hurdles to overcome. Ross Cullen in Paris reporting for DD India. And Australia unveiled their new Olympic ceremony uniform on Wednesday to mark 100 days until Paris 2024 begins. For the first time, the Australian Olympians' oath will be on the inside jacket pocket with the names of all 301 Australian Olympic champions throughout the jacket lining. The outfits will also feature indigenous artwork. Walking together from Olympic boxer Paul Fleming used in the pocket square, scarf and with the Olympians' oath on the inside lining. And Borussia Dortmund stormed into the Champions League semi-finals with a rip-roaring 4-2 home win over Atletico Madrid on Tuesday that saw them fight back from a 2-1 defeat in the first leg to win the tie 5-4 on aggregate. Julian Brandet put Dortmund level on aggregate in the 34th minute and five minutes later Dortmund took the lead in the quarter-final tie as Ian Madsen cut in from the left and drilled a perfectly placed shot in at the foot of the far post. Dortmund had not reached the last four of the Champions League since they finished runners-up in 2012-2013. This is just the fourth time the German club have advanced beyond the quarter-finals. And Paris Saint-Germain's Kylian Mbappe scored twice in the second half to help guide his side to a 4-1 comeback win at a 10-man Barcelona in their Champions League quarter-final second leg and wrap up a 6-4 aggregate victory on Tuesday. Rafinina gave Barca the lead in the 12th minute while PSG's Ausmain Damble fired home for the visitors in the 40th to equalize. 14 minutes later, Vithena put them ahead with a strike from the edge of the box in the 54th. Joao Cancelo fouled Damble in the 61st minute to concede a penalty that Mbappe fired into the top corner. With this win, PSG has now set up a semi-final place against Borussia Dortmund.
and Rafael Nadal beat Flavio Caboli at the Barcelona Open on Tuesday in his first tournament since January and first appearance on clay since the 2022 French Open. The Spaniard ran out a comfortable 6-2-6-3 winner over Italian Caboli to set up a round of 16 match against Australia's Alex de Menor. Second seed Andre Rublev of Russia crashed out of the tournament with a world number 8 beat in 6-4-7-6 by 22-year-old American Brandon Nakashima. Spaniard Juan Munar eased through with a 6-3-6-1 victory over Yoshihito Nishoika of Japan. All right, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates from India and across the world on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. Scan the QR code on the screen to download now. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lipakshi Kurana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India Live.